Welcome into a Sunday edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway here with you. No Wildcat game yesterday to recap or go over, but plenty to look forward to with the final eight games of the season coming our way starting on Friday, and then also uh, plenty in the Big 12 yesterday that was fairly interesting. Um, probably the two biggest developments, UCF blowing a massive lead, and uh, then Texas Tech, they throttled Houston, but West Virginia continues to keep Neil Brown his job. And I mean, it's something that DY and I have talked about a handful of times already this year. It's like, okay, you know, they might win too many games and they'll have to keep him. I don't think it's a question now that West Virginia is going to win too many games and Neil Brown's going to be back next year. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I just think that West Virginia was probably already uh, resigned to the fact that they were going to have to boot him out of their new AD. And uh, we'll see what comes out of that. But it all ties back into K-State and what we saw yesterday in the Big 12, which is, you know, I have buddies texting me that, oh, the, the TCU losing this game might mean the Big 12 sucks even more. Yeah, you might be right about that. And that's uh, that's not a bad thing for K-State right now. If, if the rest of the league is terrible, uh, that puts K-State in a pretty good spot. But we will continue with uh, business as usual here this week and kind of you use some of the same formatting just without a game to talk about yesterday. Um, now, last time we talked, it was K-State coming off the win against UCF. After seeing what happened to UCF, does, does that change your thoughts at all on how maybe impressive or not impressive K-State's win against the Knights were? It really doesn't. <clears throat> it didn't change mine much. Like, I suppose I did think early in that game when UCF was pounding them, I thought, well, this is going to look really good. And then, of course, Baylor made the comeback. And I don't I don't know what that says about <clears throat> Baylor, UCF, or us necessarily. Um, I think it probably says the most about UCF and where they're at. And, and you know, look, really looking at all these new teams, they're what combined one and seven now. Uh, in the league in their first two weeks as a Big 12 team. So I think they're seeing that the, it's a tough challenge. Um, I think it was Hol Holgerson. I read the article about Texas Tech in Houston, and he said something about Tech having P5 or P5 athletes, more P5 bodies. And I think perhaps some of these teams are starting to realize that now as they as they get into Big 12 play. Yeah, the new teams are you said one in seven is the one number. And, seven, I believe, and, yeah. and one of the win and the only win is because BYU played Cincinnati yeah. Friday night. So yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's it's I mean, it's apparent the way that things are set right now. And I think we expected that with a lot of these schools coming in. UCF maybe not as much, <laughs> but I, I think the thing we probably learned about UCF, it's safe to say they are not a second half team. Yes. Uh things yeah. have not gone well for them in the second <laughs> half. I thought it was funny seeing uh, some UCF account tweeted something about like, if this is power five football, then give me more of it or whatever. And during the first half of the game, I'm thinking, well, you got power five football last week and it didn't go well. And now if this is power five football, UCF might be looking to see if they can back out of the big 12 at this point, because it's not <laughs> been a, uh, a friendly start for them. Uh, Drew, wh what did you make of the, uh, the UCF result? yesterday and if that you know changes anything in your mind about k-state's win over them i mean honestly it, it 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 doesn't really mean a whole lot to me because ucf was a much better team for three quarters it, and with the unbalanced schedule it's not like they played like oklahoma where you don't where like k-state isn't going to play them because you have to play baylor anyway so like it it doesn't really do a whole lot for me in like that sense of case it has to beat Baylor anyway probably if they want to keep going with with what we think that they could do mm -hmm. this season so it, it says more about just like the the total collapse in the fourth quarter and I don't think I've ever seen a fourth quarter that bad besides maybe uh the Iowa State case State game in 15 <laughs> but it, it seemed like everything that could go wrong went wrong but then if you're UCF like after you got that fourth down conversion you had to feel so good when Timmy yeah. McLean is just running around and ends up finding somebody, and then you still can't capitalize on that. So it, it says more about just that it was an all-time collapse more than anything else, I think. You know, it's funny. You you mentioned Iowa State in 2015. The second you said Iowa State, I thought you were going to talk about K-State in uh, 2018 in Ames yeah. <laughs> when it felt like they had a, a, you know, a, a large lead that wasn't going to be sacrificed. 
I mean, they were up 17 with 10 minutes bad. left. Uh, yeah, that was – Dean and I talked about it on Friday, oddly enough, about how that team uh, – you could make the case that they easily could have ended up 8-4 and four or 4-8, four and eight, and they ended up 5-5 five and five, or maybe even 3-9 and nine in some of those situations. But they were in a lot of games. Basically, it was like Oklahoma and West Virginia were the only games they weren't competitive in that year. They just let some slip, but – yeah, kind of a kind of a, a weird weird deal, but yeah, bad for UCF yesterday. Honestly, it doesn't change my thought on how K State played because even if UCF isn't that good, K State went out there, they got their three score lead, put them away, and you know they they bounced back like they needed to. K State, you know, asserted their dominance over a team that was inferior when they played them, and I really think that's all that matters. I mean, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't banking UCF as a high quality win for K-State, but it was a good win and obviously one that they needed. Uh, let's let's roll in now. Any cause for concern this week for K-State playing Oklahoma State? This is not a good football team. We've, we've continued to learn that Oklahoma State is not very good, but is there anything about the Cowboys that, that gives you any concern? Uh, I'll start with Drew on this one. Uh, I mean, my main cause for concern – really doesn't have like a, a whole lot to do with the actual like game itself it, as much as it does just like going to Stillwater has been a house of horrors. Mm -hmm. So it, it's more geared towards that because I, I don't think that Oklahoma State is very good, but it, it does concern me that the game is at, in Stillwater at night. It's a blackout. It's a sellout, but there's a ton of tickets left on the secondary market. So, you know, who knows with that, but it's just it's tough to win in Stillwater. It always has been for K State, and it I think it's only happened twice in my lifetime. So it, that that's a cause for concern. Well, if if it's a sellout, but there's still plenty of tickets available, I'm sure uh, the KU Media Mafia will will buy those up and just give them out for free to any of their <laughs> followers that want them. They, they've been known to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, fan for you, is there anything about this game with Oklahoma State that, that should be concerning in any way for K-State? Or, you know, I guess maybe it doesn't even have to do with Oklahoma State. It's just more so the fact after a layoff, K-State going out there and having some things that leave them susceptible. No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think the layoff is, as we talked about last week, I think it's good for K-State just to get some people healthy, hopefully, and, and to maybe even get some coaching up and corrections on the defensive side, especially in the secondary and, and discipline wise. And then, you know, perhaps fixing and getting wide receivers healthy, fixing some of the past concepts where, you know, in case they struggled, struggled with a, the drop back pass the last couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> but on paper, Oklahoma state is, is not good. Um, really they're, they're decent on special teams, but the offense and defense, they're not very good. Um, they've got issues with quarterback, they seem to have internal uh, issues in in their roster in their locker room. You know, maybe you know one slight fear is maybe instead of splitting a week off for them too. You know, they had to buy as well, so maybe that gives them a chance to figure some things out and galvanize themselves. But I don't know the uh, <clears throat> the end of Gundy the last one in a quarter years hasn't looked real good. So I don't know. I don't anticipate it being a, a tough game, but I, I agree with Drew. The the, the weird Stillwater hex um, in winning, really in football and basketball, is is kind of something that's a concern, but not a big one. So I I think we'll be fine, but you never know. It's college football. I mean, you, we just talked about UCF Baylor and the end of that game. So yeah. it, it's <clears throat> it's been a weird place for K State, no doubt. Especially, I mean, under Chris Kleiman, you think about the two games. That they've played down there. Obviously, 2021 was weird. I mean, it got off to a weird start. Uh, I mean, K State kind of gifted Oklahoma State some points. They kept themselves in the game, but then Will Howard got hurt. Well, I mean, that was that was still what we would call bad Will Howard, but Will Howard, I thought, actually played fairly well. I mean, you look at the numbers, he was like four of 12 for 50 yards in that game, but I felt like he was playing better and would have given K State a chance had he stayed in that game. Instead, he goes out and it's Jaron Lewis the rest of the way for K State. And they the only time the offense did anything was when he somehow luckily popped a ball out of a giant scrum and Deuce Vaughn took it like 50 some yards. Um, but yeah, this this is a place that the history suggests 
it, it can be tricky, but there's nothing about this team for Oklahoma State that should. And I, you know, I, I put some weight into, you know, Chris Kleiman last year was kind of checking some boxes about teams that he hadn't been able to beat yet at K-State. Like beating Baylor was a big one. Uh, they hadn't beaten, uh, you know, they hadn't been able to beat Oklahoma State yet. And they were able to do that last year, obviously, in a pretty big way. And now you look around at like what's left for him to do at K-State that he hasn't before the Big 12 completely falls apart. Well, it's beat Texas in any fashion and overcome this year two very brutal winnable games that they've played in Austin under Chris Klein in 2019 and 2021. And then also, I mean, winning in Stillwater to kind of rid yourself of those nasty, disgusting games um, that, that took place the first two times you went there. And also, I mean – I said this before the Missouri game, you know, said, oh, hey, the forecast looks fine. I don't think we're going to experience any weather delays or anything uh, this time in Stillwater, <laughs> which is good. Um, but it's been a tricky place for them, and they, they've had some bad performances. Like that, that 2019 game, they weren't going to win that game probably, but at the end, you know, Chris Kleiman was settling for like field goals, and it was like playing to not get your butt kicked as opposed to doing what you needed to do to win, which – like he did the total inverse of that against Alabama in the Sugar Bowl this year, where or last year, where it was like, hey, you know, we we know we have to do this to make everything go our way to beat this type of team, and they tried it. Um, and now that's probably him having more confidence in the talent on his roster at this point, but also probably learning uh, how how to manage and play things at this level. But we'll we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, one question for the week for the Wildcats. We'll do it earlier in the show. That way we can. Uh, kind of dive into more of the Oklahoma State stuff just after this. But uh, if there's one question you have that K-State needs to answer either on Tuesday in their media availability or come s- Friday night when they play Oklahoma State, uh, what is that question? I, I think for me is um, Oklahoma State's pretty poor <clears throat> at, at, at giving up explosive plays on defense. They've given up a bunch, and uh, both in the run and the pass, something K-State hasn't been great at this year. So is this a game where K-State can kind of get some explosive plays, uh, especially in the passing game, because their pass defense is really bad. Uh, they don't create much havoc. They give up big click plays like crazy. Uh, their best aspect of their whole team probably, besides special teams, is their run defense is okay, like maybe slightly above average, but their pass defense rates 100 or worse in a bunch of different categories that I look at. So this is a game, I think, where K-State can, can exploit a, a pretty poor – Oklahoma State defense and, and hopefully get some big plays uh, in the passing game, which would be nice to see. Yeah, mine is uh, a little bit different. It's uh, how do you remedy some of the secondary issues in one week? Because I, I'm just interested to see, because Oklahoma State is still capable on offense. And you would expect them to pull out a lot of the stops that they possibly can next week, or I guess this coming week now. So how do you remedy some of the eye discipline issues or crashing down too hard in one week (laughs) where it seems like a lot of it is inexperience and really just like lacking game experience. So how does that get fixed over a bye week is interesting to figure out. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, going to be fairly fascinating to see how they're able to address that. And I mean, I, I side with Fan here. This is an Oklahoma State team that I look around at what's happened to them in the passing game and see how susceptible they are. Where I don't know who you put it on. I tend to think it's probably more about receivers. Like I know that you know the message boards and everybody else was wanting to hold Will Howard to a pretty strict standard for some of the, the balls that he missed against UCF. Um, I just think when you're throwing to the to the smallest receivers in the Big 12 and the separation already isn't that much, it's a little trickier. Um, I would like to see Will Howard be more precise because I do think that he's had some of those issues this year, at least further down the field. Like That's the thing that I'll remind people is he was under a 60% passer last year. He's close to 66% this year. So he has risen his, his completion percentage by almost six-plus points. And so he's better at that. It's just downfield. What we're used to seeing Will Howard hit after last season hasn't been there. I think that's likely because he doesn't have Malik Knowles or Cade Warner, two guys that were really experienced in college football and had started to prove themselves as down threat, downfield threats, which 
is wild to say about Cade Warner, but he legitimately could do that last year. Um, and like I said, you need Keegan Johnson to be that guy. You need somebody else to step up. We'll see if Jaden Jackson can do it against better talent that they're facing now. And I don't think Phillip Brooks ever will be that type of guy. So the options are limited there. It also probably puts a little bit more on guys like Ben Sennett and Garrett Oakley when they're involved in the passing game uh, to actually make sure you catch the ball. Um, now, for Garrett Oakley, I don't fault him. That was that was truly a terrible ball that Will Howard threw uh, against UCF. So I, I, I side with Fan on this one. It's, it's all about just chucking the ball all over the place. And you can probably still – rack up over a hundred some yards with DJ Giddens against Oklahoma state. Um, but you know, that their one big 12 game they played in, they were pretty stingy against the run against Iowa state. Um, now that's an Iowa state team that uh, hasn't really ran the ball. <laughs> Fantastic this year. They, they lost their starting running back before the season because of all the gambling stuff, but you should be looking to be aggressive and throwing the ball. Like, this is the type of game where if you ask what K-State's offensive strength is, you would say, well, it's probably Will Howard. Will Howard is probably the best player on offense in any of the you know, singular positions that can make a difference. Like We know Cooper Beebe is the best player on this offense, but until Cooper Beebe's running the ball for 20 yards or throwing it for 35, uh, I, he, he can't make that big of an impact in what I'm asking for. And I think this is the type of game where a lot of coaches would say, all right, they suck at defending the pass. We have a really good quarterback. We're going to put it in your hands early and often, and we're just going to try and bludgeon them from the start. Like that's what that's what USC would would do to a bad team. They'd say, "Well, yeah, Caleb Williams is probably the best quarterback in college football. Let's just have him throw it a bunch." And that's kind of what they did to Colorado yesterday. Um, so that's what I'm I'm looking forward to, and and we'll see what comes out of that. All right. So K State Oklahoma State is the matchup. Uh, Oklahoma State. The background on them. Two bad opponents that they barely beat to start the season in Central Arkansas and Arizona State. Uh, I, I still don't know how they beat Arizona State by two scores, even though Arizona State's terrible. And then after that two-game losing streak, the bad home loss to South Alabama. And then last week, they lost 34-27 to to Iowa State, who we know isn't a very good team. And this is why, you know, one of the reasons why Fan brings it up. Rocco Beck, who looked like he didn't have a pulse, uh, at quarterback was 27 of 38 for 348 yards and three touchdowns against Oklahoma State, which, you know, by the way, Iowa State was able to throw the ball around early on Oklahoma yesterday. Also a very bad defense that we've uh, taken stock of. Now, Rocco Beck did throw two picks in that game, kind of fell down to earth. So Oklahoma State, not very good there on offense and defensively, they've given it up. The quarterback struggles have been there. Um, Drew, what, what, <laughs> What, if anything, have you taken away from Oklahoma State uh, through these first four games of the season that K-State should be aware of? Um, I mean, honestly, it it has a little bit to do with the passing game. Like, they're at least capable. They're probably better passing the ball, I would say, than running. Alan Bowman has been in the Big 12 before, so he's seen it all. And Jaden Bray is a pretty solid wide receiver. He's not going to blow you away, but he he's he's pretty good. It what's more like astounding to me, I would say, about Oklahoma State is that you look at Mike Gundy's career and how good of an offensive coach that he is, and this offense just it isn't good. <laughs> like to, to to put it simply, it's just not very good which is crazy to think about with Oklahoma State. Well, that probably has a lot to do with thinking that Alan Bowman is the answer at quarterback. Uh, yeah. Bad move on his part there. Uh, yeah, Al, I mean, Alan Bowman, who now has a starting job, it is his, it would appear. Uh, he's he's not been good this year. I mean, the QBR is 33.7. The numbers are terrible. Uh, and he's complete like 53% of his passes, 513 yards, two touchdowns, three picks. He's not good, uh, not at all. But, and but it's crazy you think about what he was at like Texas Tech. He was better at Texas Tech, and I, I, you know, I thought it was more hype than anything about Alan Bowman with how Tech people talked about him. Oh yeah, but it's it's crazy. Like you look at his stats, and like they're still somehow better passing than running. Like it, yeah. it makes it makes no but sense. Really, that's only because they pass it so much. They pass it like sixty-two percent of the time. 
but they rank 100 or worse in passing efficiency, passing success rate, and passing su- explosiveness. So they they have okay passing numbers, but that's only because of volume. <laughs> because they just because throw it a ton. They throw it. It's weird because you're right. I don't know what Gundy, you know, you would think Bowman is a – quarterback with a pulse and they generally have some wide receivers with some talent. And I, th- I think they still do, but man, they are not efficient. You know, overall their offense is 95 or worse in like every major advanced category that I look at. So um, that it's, it's a game where, you know, Drew, you mentioned our secondary and hoping we can fix some of those issues. This is a game you would think you can get some health, uh, healthy confidence back by beating a, a, a bad team, but again, you're going on the road on a weird night, Friday night. So you never know, but this looks like a, a game where K-State's defense should dominate a pretty bad offense and hopefully get some confidence back in that secondary. Well, so you talk about, Fan, the the passing of Oklahoma State, and it's just because they do it a lot more. It, is there anything that that we should know about the run game for Oklahoma State to where – if they do realize that, hey, it's okay to run the ball a little bit more uh, and lessen how much you're putting on a bad quarterback, uh, is is there anything of note there for Oklahoma State that you've seen? I mean, a little, but they're just average. I mean, it's the best part of their offense, but they're just average in in EPA and success rate and explosiveness in the running game. So um, they can be decent at it, but uh, it's not something that scares me, especially with – the, the run defense being K-State's strength, I don't think it looks like something Oklahoma State can exploit. I mean, I, th- I think it, it comes down to what our fears have been the last couple of weeks is, is do we make a mistake in the secondary and give up a big pass play to, you know, they still do have a couple of explosive wide receivers that can can make a play. So that's still my worry looking at this game is, is will, um, will our secondary make a mistake or two that gives 14 easy points to Oklahoma State that, you know, makes it tougher when you're on the road to do stuff like that. Well, it's probably, I mean, I don't know. It feels weird to talk about teams in the Big 12 like this, especially Oklahoma State, but it feels like K-State probably will give up maybe a, a, a dumb play or two, and it will give Oklahoma State a little bit of life. But this doesn't like Oklahoma State from the team anywhere to actually compete for eight minutes with K-State or a lot of other teams that I would consider average mm-hmm. to good in the Big 12. Like, I don't think Oklahoma State can compete with KU. I don't think they can do it with UCF. They obviously are not going to be able to do it with Oklahoma and Texas. Um, you know, you can go down the list and, and find some other. Uh, I mean, the way the way West Virginia is playing right now, West Virginia is probably able to consider it a, an easy one. Like, I just think that this is the, the type of game where – if K-State really comes out and plays their best and is totally locked in and, and can take care of business from the get-go, we're probably looking at another game like last year where, you know, 48 nothing pops up. Now, if you dilly-dally a little bit, this is the type of game that could probably end up being like 31-14. to 14 and It's like, hey, we got our win. We got out of there. It's fine. I just – I have a tough time seeing Oklahoma State being able to score more than a couple of times unless, I mean, the K-State defense comes out and they spent the entire bye week trying to get worse than what they were the first four weeks of the season. I don't know how you see things, Drew, but that's that's where I go. Yeah, I mean, I, I just – there is a part of me that thinks that Oklahoma State might be the worst team in the league. Oh, I've – uh, the last two weeks of Big 12 rankings, I've had them down there, and they'll be there again this week. So it, it's very possible that if everything goes right, it's like you said, it, it could be a lot like last year. Yeah, it just it doesn't seem like things are uh, in a in a great spot right now. But I guess we'll uh, we'll see what you know what ends up happening and everything that that comes out of that. Uh, a couple of other things that I you know want to take note of real quick i was going to look oklahoma state um they've allowed nine sacks this season that is uh putting them like towards the the half of the big 12 in terms of sack um surprisingly texas is also down there with nine now they've played one extra game um but also tcu baylor houston texas tech they've all given up double digit sacks this season but oklahoma state's in the same vein as them because they've played one less game now so 
that's obviously something that K-State can exploit. We, we know that Khalid Duke is leading the league in sacks right now for K-State. Maybe that's changed after yesterday's game. That's a big deal. And Brendan Mott is playing well. I feel like, you know, all the defensive ends have, have elevated their game from last year. And then they get the pressure in the middle with the, the nose guard. So it seems like a game that is just kind of prime for K-State's defense to step up and, and do a lot of really good things. And then it also lends itself to offensively K-State can go out there and, and take care of business. Uh, I mentioned DJ Giddens earlier, Fan. Well, what what can you tell us about Oklahoma State's run defense? Because that's obviously something that K-State would like to probably use a lot more now that they've figured out they can have a game like they did against UCF. Yeah, they're, I mean, it's probably the, the strongest part of their um, their team, I would say. There's they're number 23 in success rate allowed uh, with the rush, but they're 110th in explosiveness allowed with their run defense. Um, pretty average on some other stats like line yards and stuff rate. Um, so they're decent at it. Um, it's it's their strength um, on defense. But, again, I, I do think um, because K-State has the ability to pass the ball pretty well, and we actually – throw up more than we run it percentage wise. Um, I do think that makes it tougher. Um, I also think our ability, even if it's just six or eight snaps, our ability to do quarterback run successfully. Um, I think both the Missouri game and the UCF game, our quarterback run game, a success rate was a hundred percent in both games per down and distance in in like 16 snaps. So I think that makes us tricky to defend. Um, I, I am anxious to see, how we balance DJ Giddens and, and Treshawn Ward this week if he's back, which I assume he will be. And uh, will Giddens have more of the load or will um, it, it be back to splitting time again? Because, you know, Giddens had a really good game. And um, where does Ward fit? And will Ward be used more in the passing game, which I think he's been more successful catching bat balls out of the backfield, although Giddens, you know, was their leading receiver against UCF too. So, We'll see what happens with that that front. Um, it, it could test us a little bit, I think, because their front is decent. Uh, their front seven is decent. But, again, I, I do think, end of the day, K-State will be able to make some plays in the running game too. Yeah, yeah. You look at that first game of year for Dane with their number of attempts. Uh, Giddens got four more in the SEMO game. Ward got four more in the Troy game. And then they were, they were each at nine against Mizzou. I think if the offensive line is playing like it did against UCF, DJ Giddens is going to get easily more carries. I think yeah. that sets up more. Yeah. I think when the offensive line was struggling, they were looking more so to what Trey's skills are, which is, okay, he's got the more, you know, better chance, more of a likelihood to bounce one outside and make something happen on his own and, and make a big play. Whereas obviously DJ Giddens can, can have the big plays, but he needs that initial movement up top where he can get through the line to, to bust through. And then he, obviously once he gets going and he's, you know, gained five yards or something, he can run dudes over and he can outrun people. So uh, I think it was probably a style thing, but now that you maybe feel better about your offensive line, I would assume the rest of the way, or at least until, you know, if, unless DJ Giddens hits a wall or skids somewhere, he's going to be the defined lead back and it will be Ward used more along the lines of, you know, passing and, and everything else. I mean, probably similar that were injuries involved, but similar to like the James Gilbert, Jordan Brown mm -hmm. stuff in 2019, yeah. where it became pretty apparent early, like Jordan Brown could run the ball, but they were going to use him to throw it, you know, a little bit more yeah. and get him involved that way, which probably suits Trayshawn Ward's skill set a little bit better uh, at this point in time, especially if you can rely on, Giddens in the backfield to, to run for you. Yeah, I think that's accurate. And I think uh, the other thing is, you know, you mentioned, I, I don't know what it was uh, at DJ's yak, but going back and watching, rewatching that game and charting every play, he had a lot of plays where he, after contact was, was getting extra yards, making guys miss in the, in space, which, you know, probably surprised a little bit, especially his ability to kind of put a little juke move on and make people miss was probably maybe the more surprising thing that some fans might have been surprised by after that game. But, 
you know, he proved to be a pretty diverse back. Uh, all right. So I'm, I'm looking at what PFF said for DJ Giddens yards after contact. Uh, any, any of you want to venture a guess? I mean, he had 207 total rushing yards in the game. So rushing yards after contact for DJ Giddens against UCF. I'll let uh, either of you give a, give a guess on the number. I'm going to say 70. I was going to go with 65. So we're, we're, we're on the same, we're on the same page. All right. Well, you are both way off. It was 109. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's that's uh, impressive. This is, uh, is what they have listed here. So, you know, it's again, not the gospel, but at least what that's we have good. to go off of. Um, and yeah, he, I mean, he can, he can bruise and get through guys. So, uh, that's, that's a big deal for, uh, for K state. And we'll see if he does it against Oklahoma state. All right. Let's roll on now. Time for a little college football outsider. Obviously, we stayed at home all yesterday, or at least hopefully that's what you guys got to do uh, and watch football, uh, something we don't get to do very often throughout the year with you know K-State playing. So it's either traveling to the game or just being in the stadium, and it's tougher to view every game like you'd want to. Uh, I'll start with Drew. What was, uh, what was the most notable game or thing you saw yesterday in college football? I mean, I think it's that – I'll stay. In, I'll stay in the Big Twelve, and I'll say that West Virginia four and one. I mean, it, it, we've touched on it a little bit. Uh, Neil Brown saving his job. They keep winning. It's never pretty, but they keep winning. Like it, it's impressive to see them keep continue to keep winning, because like I said, the the games just are are not pretty. But that that's what they want to do now is to muck it up and make teams earn it and TCU didn't earn it. I think they missed three field goals last night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, they missed one and two got blocked uh, and the two got blocked in like the last four minutes of the game. Yeah. Uh, and real, you know, real quick on that TCU fans have <laughs> plummeted in, in what I think of them. They are, they, they might be the worst in the league right now yeah. from, like a tr- like a true like you're not a good person standpoint you know like <laughs> I, I was thinking about this last night because I was getting ready to to shower and so I was like well you know I'll throw like the game on on my phone so I don't really miss anything and I, as I was getting ready to get in is when the the second West Virginia player had to be carted off the field or whatever and they were booing and it was apparent that he you know it was a legit injury like they they threw the air cast on him all that stuff and they were booing him and I was just thinking to myself man like these people are the worst. Like they, you know, they were throwing stuff on the the field last year at K State. Uh, they, you know, the, their fans. I don't know if you remember this, Drew. Like they were like turning around, like banging on the like windows. I, of the I was about to say, do you remember that? Because yeah, it, it, it was all like directed at K State media too. It was so weird. It was the strangest thing, and I mean, obviously, there's also an arrogance that comes with being, you know, one of the private schools in the conference. There's also an arrogance that comes with being a Texan, apparently. Uh, it's just there's a lot there. And I think the fact that K-State played them twice last year in football in major games that were really tight and, and competitive. And then obviously K-State played them three times in basketball last year. And they have a basketball team that's very easy to dislike. I mean, you look at Jamie Dixon and it's just like, yeah, I don't, I don't like that guy. Uh, Eddie Lampkin, also not a very likable guy. He's gone now. Mike Miles, I didn't like him because he was a fake good player. I mean, everybody else kept trying to tell me that he was good. I, I still don't buy it. Uh, somehow he swindled the Dallas Mavericks into getting a, a roster spot this year, which, by the way, I don't want Mark Cuban hearing this and then doing something more than blocking me on Twitter. Uh, Mark Cuban has me blocked on Twitter. Noted Mavericks <laughs> fan Mason Voth is blocked by the owner of the team on Twitter only because I didn't tweet at Cuban. I questioned the deal for Kyrie Irving, which seems more than fair to question why any team would want that head case and pain in the ass on their team. But, you know, whatever. So I, they're the worst because I was thinking to myself, okay, they are legitimately like the throwing of the trash, the booing people, like all this, like it's fine, but the dude was legitimately hurt. You know, we, we can have our fun and I can talk about how much I dislike people that went to the University of Kansas because – they have a certain arrogance and a certain way about most of them that I'm like, yeah, you know what? We're, we probably wouldn't be friends, but that's okay. Like, you don't have to be friends with everybody. 
I've never gotten the feeling, though, even despite my trips to Allen Fieldhouse or whatever, that I'm going to get booing towards injured players and trash being thrown on the field or the court by KU fans. I think I just hate their personalities. I don't hate them as people. I just, you know, what? I think I hate TCU people as people now. I think they suck. So <laughs> that's uh, that's my big takeaway from yesterday in the Big 12. I My wife was even, you know, saying stuff about TCU. She's like, oh, these people are the worst. Uh, let me, let me, let me read some of these. Uh, although let's see, uh, <laughs> she said, well, this is, so I was, I was away from her. She was in a different part of the house. So she was texting me. She said, uh, TCU fans are booing an injured player, like very clearly a real injury, uh, carted the guy off the field and said they aren't replaying it because of how bad, but yet fans boo when he was down. And then she said, pretty effed up school. We'll gladly cheer against them. Stupid frogs. <laughs> Stupid frogs. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, look, she took TCU to task yesterday. I also say all this as I have a cousin that is a big TCU fan. They live in Fort Worth like five minutes from campus. His wife went there. His kid, giant. I mean, I, I did not enjoy seeing his kid wearing a Matt Duggan jersey all of last year. Like that just whatever. <laughs> Uh, also, Sonny Dykes, kind of a psycho, too. He went off on the ref yesterday. So I got a lot of issues with TCU. So they're, they're down there. They suck. Uh, we'll, we'll move on. A fan, what did, what did you see yesterday in, in college football or the Big 12? Well, <clears throat> this is a little – I agree with Drew's W. Uh, West Virginia's win was probably my biggest surprise, along with Baylor's comeback. But uh, I did find the Texas Tech game a little bit interesting – probably because we're playing them soon as well. Um, I mean, we talked about Oklahoma State maybe being the worst team in the league. I think it's still Houston. They're not very good. Um, they came into Lubbock and and really played really well for a half, and Donovan Smith was, was really good for them as well. Um, and then Texas Tech kind of put them away, mainly, you know, partially due to special teams. They had a kickoff return and a block punt to kind of put that game away. Uh, my, my The takeaway, though, is Tech – is what they did in that game sustainable because they changed uh, – they come into, that, come into that game running the ball 42% of the time. So they were a pass-heavy team like you kind of expect out of Tech. Yesterday they ran at 63% of the time. They had 200-yard rushers. Uh, they played quite a bit slower. They were one of the top five fastest teams in the country at almost 20 seconds per snap, and they played about 25 or 26 seconds per snap in that game and only had 59 snaps total on offense. So can they change completely how they play and go to more of a run run attack, win with defense? Um, I don't know if that's sustainable them. I think it's doable against the worst team in the league at home, which it was. But it's it's just interesting to see, what, you know, with their quarterback hurt, what, that, what they're going to be, um, especially coming up and us going down there in a couple weeks. Um, and, and looking forward to that game. Not that I'm looking past Oklahoma State, but that was interesting to me because because Tech was besides Texas and Oklahoma was the next most uh, yeah. favored team in mm -hmm. their game because they were 27 spots higher in the F plus ranking than than Houston. So uh, that one was interesting to me because it was really a pretty close game at half, and then Tech put them away. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that was the one to me where it was like that game could either be nothing and have no bearing on what I think of either team, or it could tell me a lot about Texas Tech. And at first, I thought it was going to tell me, but then they put them away. I just, I, I think you're right, though. It, we, we won't really know until they they see somebody different other than Houston, who's not very good. And I mean, we know Taj Brooks is a capable running back mm -hmm. if they they turn to mm -hmm. him more, um, but. I, I'm just – it'll be fascinating to see how they, they work things out throughout the year. I At this stage, I do think, though, my my, my tune has changed. I, I think K-State wins that game in Lubbock now if I, if I had to pick at this point. Um, it's still going to be a tough game. Like, I don't want anybody thinking that it's not. But it's not to the level of – I was convinced K-State was losing in Lubbock this year. I mean, it felt like that was going to be a good tech team. And I always say, like, these teams on the rise, they need like that monumental big home win or whatever. And you could say for Tech, it was Texas last year, but that really wasn't like an ascension that was going on there. Like that was just kind of fluky. It wasn't in the middle of this. This year, that's what K-State would have been for them. Um, that's, I mean, that's why I'm convinced that KU beats Oklahoma and Lawrence this year. I think 
KU is looking for that first signature win and better for it to be against Oklahoma than K State uh, in that building. But Tech Tech is fine. They're just a lot more along the lines of what we probably think of West Virginia and TCU being right now, and that's not the scariest of teams for K State to face. Somebody you have to be alert of, but you can you don't have to be you know crying inside because you're about to face Texas Tech. Uh, see, you said that you felt okay about tech after the second half i i feel kind of worse about where i think texas tech is because of how long they let houston hang around and you allowed 28 points in the first half like i I guess that they scored 35 but that that is cause for concern i think for them yeah i mean and they they did let donovan smith light him up uh he's 29 of 40 for four touchdowns and 335 yards which I'd have to go and look, but and maybe fan has us on him. But like, what his what his text pressure on the quarterback been like this year? Um, like by the numbers, what 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 is there? Because that was one of the big things at media days that Joey McGuire was spouting off about was you know they, they just lost Tyree Wilson, a first round pick mm-hmm. that got to the quarterback, and he said, well, actually, like you know, I I think we might be better in that position this year than and now. And, uh, where 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 do they sit, and how concerning is that? I, I would say they're not. I mean, I I, I use havoc, uh, TFLs, sacks, tackles for losses. Sorry, Mason, sacks, <laughs> TFLs, <laughs> pass breakups. Oh, by the way, I was listening to their game a little bit driving yesterday, and he actually did say tackles for loss one time. Oh, okay, so. all right. Well, then you know, uh, he's <laughs> maybe he's, he's listening to you, Mason. He's in his ten step program to <laughs> to get better. Anyway, before yesterday's game, Tech. Tech's front seven havoc rate was number 117 in the country at 8%. So they are not causing a lot of havoc with their front seven um, okay. this year okay. so far. I don't know what they did yesterday, but it's not good. Well, then way, I, I'll, I, I'll throw this out there. Tyree Wilson is kind of horrible right now in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> I was, well, he, did he get drafted by the Seahawks or where uh, he the Raiders? Raiders. Yeah, Raiders. That's yeah, right. They have him as like the lowest rated uh, rookie edge rusher right now. Mm. 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 Well, that's tough, you know. Uh, n- not Felix. Uh, I think, you know, honestly, you talk about that then, like looking at what K State has coming up on the schedule, it, the next two games then are going to be games where you can throw the ball. And obviously, getting right against Oklahoma State is good because Texas Tech is better than Oklahoma State probably still by about a mile and a half. And so I think that if you get that confidence and you get things kind of clicking and locked in against Oklahoma State, then you give yourself an even better chance to go on the road in Lubbock and realize that you have some things that you can do well with. I mean, Donovan Smith, do we even think of Donovan Smith as a guy that can throw the ball like he did yesterday? Typically, probably not. So uh, I'll be I'll be interested to watch that. Uh, it, for me, inside the Big 12 yesterday – Probably West Virginia had the most significant win. Um, but also, I think that there's a lot to be learned from the Texas and KU game um, about a multitude of things. So let's start with, you know, here. I'll, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the scores there on your screen. But uh, Texas throttles KU 40-14. to 14. It's kind of close at halftime. Texas, you know, had some deficiencies there. Um, KU obviously is a different team when Jalen Daniels doesn't play. I don't know that Jalen Daniels playing makes up for a 26-point loss and also the fact that um, with Jalen Daniels' back problems right now, I don't think that he would be able to play defense for KU. Um, That would just be my assumption. Uh, KU yesterday showed a couple of things. The defense is still terrible like we expected. Texas ran the ball freely. And offensively, if Jason Bean is playing, that's just – it's like a chicken with his head cut off. He's running around trying to throw things and hope it goes. And Jalen Daniels plays like that sometimes, but Jalen Daniels is actually good at football. Like that's my takeaway. Um, and then also, you know, the best ability is availability. Jalen Daniels does not have that ability right now. It would appear um, because I said it yesterday, but since KU fans wanted to put Will Howard on his deathbed, the week of the sunflower showdown last year, uh, Will Howard has not missed a game despite being, you know, clearly banged up and questionable heading into the game with uh, with UCF. Jalen Daniels has now missed two games after 
seemingly being fine in the buildup to him, but just out of nowhere getting, you know, a back injury that, that led up to the start of the season. And then also, uh, you know, they expected him to play up until like five minutes before the game yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of strange how that works out. And at some point, like that's something you have to factor into all this. Um, and Texas, with what they were able to do, like up front, KU's run game was basically non-existent yesterday outside of a couple of plays early where they kind of fooled them with the option. And then Jason Bean with the lateral of his life getting slammed and losing the ball with a fumble uh, leading to a touchdown. So KU is better. I would still venture to say with Jalen Daniels playing, I think they're probably the fourth best team in the Big 12 right now. But I think the gap is now widening where two and three is K-State and Oklahoma in whatever order you want to put them. The gap is greater between those two schools and KU than I thought it was. I still think that can change. And I know you're probably listening to this thing. Well, didn't you just say KU is going to beat Oklahoma later in the year? Yeah, I did say that. Sports doesn't have to make sense. Like, it's not all black and white, you know, but um, that's kind of what I took away from Kansas. And then on the flip side of it, Texas, I mean, the defense is is pretty pretty good. They are the, they are the real deal still. Um, but what we saw is that this is a team that is going to rely heavily on what the running back can do for you. And Quinn Ewers is still not some mega talented dude that has been fixed. Like, had some bad throws yesterday. It's clear that Steve Sarkeesian doesn't fully trust him. It wasn't until, like, garbage time, basically, that they finally started letting him throw the ball in the red zone. Like, they got to the 30-yard the line, and they're like, okay, we're going to see if we can bust one off, and if not, we're not going to let Quinn Ewers do anything dumb for us. Um, I'm, I've am i not been very high on him. I, I'm a very much a guy that's like, hey, prove it to me. He has not proven it to me. Um, so Texas, I think – Despite the fact that they blew out KU yesterday, it was never really going to be a close game, even though it felt like one of those that Texas kind of messed around and you know could have pulled a real Texas. Um, my takeaway was the depth, the the depth between Texas and everybody else in the league is not as much as I thought, at least in terms of those other top two teams, K-State and Oklahoma. Um, they're still the best. They're still good and scary. They have obviously mm -hmm. great receivers, but the quarterback that's throwing them the ball is pretty average right now. Uh, and that's a game where it's good for K-State. It's later in the year. It's going to give them some more time to hopefully get that secondary fixed. Because if you do that, then I think K-State's actually going to match up fairly well with Texas, or at least as well as anybody else in the league can. Because Texas is going to run right through Oklahoma next week, I think. Oklahoma has struggled defensively still. We saw that in the first half against Iowa State. Um so I, I really do think that uh, there were a couple of those things that stood out to me, but Texas is not – they're not all the way back. They're not this team that we should hold up on this pedestal as unbeatable in the league now because I think they showed some warts even in a, a pretty big win yesterday. Also, real quick on my boy Brian Haney, uh, for anybody that listened to Bosco's boys earlier in the week, uh, he, his name did come up. Uh, I talked about him and Ron Prince in about the same five-minute stretch. Um, Look, I want to preface this by saying every time I bring him up, John Kurtz says, but he's a really good guy. I, That's fine. I, I do not care. Yeah, you can be a great guy. But listening to the KU radio team, is it's a it's a guilty pleasure of mine, but also it's something that makes me want to consider living because um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough listen at times. And yesterday, the very first play that KU ripped off, you know, 26-yard run with Jason Bean or whatever, we get Brian Haney. No, J.D., no problem. Uh, son, let's take a look at the final score and where your problems were, uh, which is weird for a guy to say, no, J.D., no problem. He threw it to the sideline reporter a lot in the first couple of possessions, begging for him to find any siding of Jalen Daniels. He's like, uh, BMAC, any, any signs of J.D. down there yet? And their sideline reporter, he's no Matt Walters. I can tell you that. He is no Matt Walters. Those were not very in-depth <laughs> reports. Uh, it was just like, yeah, man, we haven't really seen, any, we've seen him yet. Uh, hoping we get him soon. And I was like, okay, great. This is awesome. Uh, uh, I'll, I will say a little weird that he never went on the sidelines. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, once awesome. once you're out, like, I, you know, I get it was hot down there, but maybe that would have helped us back, you know? Uh, set, set him on the bench or something and just let him – that was weird. That was very strange. It's it's an odd ordeal with 
with how that's gone on because there's been a lot of whenever he's been out, it's just there's a lot of secrecy and and weird things behind it more so than any team with a quarterback you know being out like obviously the Will Howard stuff there was secrecy and there was some kind of weirdness there but it wasn't in terms of like oh this is odd it was just that's how coaches talk about their quarterbacks when they're out I don't know well that's going to yeah. be a, a fascinating thing to follow all season long and I did hear I only heard TFL come out of his mouth yesterday so I was like oh, <laughs> of course he said it again uh, well. But- but but you you mentioned you know my takeaway again is I've always thought KU's offense is good if until their defense even becomes average yeah they're going to be struggle to be more than a six or seven one team and you know Jonathan Brooks had 218 yards and averaged 10 yards a carry against KU yesterday I mean that defense is still awful and they talk about you know several of these transfers they brought in and how much better they are up front and I. Their, their havoc numbers are good. I'll give them credit for that, but they're not stopping people and they're not yeah. keeping people from scoring. So it's still going to be a problem for them. And I just think it's one of those deals too. You got to look at who these teams have played early in the season. I mean, it's just like I, I, you know, some of the things that K State has done well, it, you know, after they played Simo and Troy, it's not like, oh, yeah, look at this. Will Howard Heisman, you know, cool. like he, he put up good numbers against terrible teams, what you're supposed to do. KU played Missouri State who is terrible as an FCS school this year, you know, because Petrino ditched him for, for A&M. Illinois, who I hate to say it as, a, as an, an honorary al- <laughs> Illini, uh, they might be the worst Power 5 team in football this year. Nevada, who might be the worst team in football this year. And then BYU, who, you know, they screwed around with Sam Houston State at home to start the year, and then Houston blasted them. Uh, BYU beat Cincinnati. I think BYU and Cincinnati aren't very good. Um, BYU is at least showing that they can maybe beat the bad teams a little bit more than Cincinnati can. And then what happened yesterday. So I just think you got to wait until teams show you what they really are against better competition, but you could still see the cracks early for KU. It's going to be kind of interesting to see how, if they're able to continue to get pressure as the year goes on, because they obviously can't stop anybody running the football. Um, That's apparent. They play UCF this week at home that's going to be probably a pretty entertaining game to watch and keep an eye on to see how it goes but then after that i mean it's a it's a good schedule for because they play byu they already won that game they play oklahoma state they play cincinnati they play iowa state this team's going to win at least seven games this year um maybe more because of the schedule and i think you look around at probably the top four teams in the big 12 you can go through their schedule and say oh because of who you play you're going to be able to win X amount of games. It's just about what you can do in those games that are toss-ups or people don't expect you to win. Um, but it'll be it'll be fascinating to watch. But they they struggled yesterday. I still, you know, as much as I've you know talked down on them here, um, although I think I've said some nice things about KU. I mean, I, I did say earlier that I don't think you're horrible people like I do <laughs> TCU fans. So you should take that with you. And again, I, I don't dislike Brian Haney. I just don't like listening to him and David Lawrence and their sideline reporter on the radio. Except I do because it's like a it's like a car wreck that you can't look away from. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how how it goes from there. All right. Uh, any other thoughts from the Big Twelve this week before we kind of look ahead to what's coming uh, this next weekend? Uh, no. I mean, BYU kind of like West Virginia. Never no game was pretty, but somehow they will they win. Yeah, and uh, my thought is, I do think, I, I do think, did is it possible Baylor w- is going to wake up after a win like that? That is a win that can yeah. help a mediocre yeah. team play better than they thought they were because they looked dead in the water when they were down thirty-five to seven. But to make that comeback, you never know what that can do to a, yeah. to a team in the locker room. Well, and you know, you look at the the schedule next mm-hmm. week then. That is that's a very interesting game with Texas Tech now, yeah. based off of how both teams kind of bounced back and responded last week. So games next week in the Big Twelve: K State, O State on Friday. Uh, that's six thirty on ESPN, and then eleven a.m. Red River, Oklahoma, Texas, ABC, and then three o'clock UCF, KU. That's three o'clock on Fox, and then two seven o'clock games: Tech and Baylor, TCU and Iowa State. Uh, Tech and Baylor is on ESPN two. Uh, TCU Iowa State, a wild one. I don't know if it's been announced yet or not. They are either going to be on Fox or FS2. So they are either <laughs> going to have eyeballs or not. 
I with, with uh, both losing yesterday, you gotta think that that might lean more <laughs> towards FS two, right? It's yeah. got to be FS two now, right? I, I, it has to be. I can't imagine it's not. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. We'll we'll see how that uh, how that ends up playing out here because <laughs> yikes! Uh, it looks like the they're gonna have to decide between Fresno State at Wyoming or TCU at Iowa State for that seven o'clock Fox window. Oh, well, so, it's got to be Fresno Wyoming. That that's probably the best yeah. Mountain West game of the year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we we've talked about K State and Oklahoma State a little bit about UCF, KU, and how Tech and Baylor is interesting. Uh, what next week in the Big Twelve are you most looking forward to seeing? Because really, Texas and Oklahoma, we get to find out a lot more about these teams now that they're now that they're going to face some legit talent. I think. I yeah. I, I think the. Oklahoma Texas game is intriguing because Oklahoma's defense. I, I agree with you. I don't think they're great, but they have numbers wise. They've been okay. Um, if you look at the analytics, um, they're, they're top 10 in defense, top 20 in defense. Um, so they've been okay. Um, this is going to be a really game to prove it, you know, and we, we talked about Texas passing game, super talented receivers. Uh, Ewer seems to make some boneheaded mistakes that, that, are costly um, and and how that's going to match up. And then Oklahoma's offense, I do think, is pretty good um, with Gabriel's, but we'll see, you know, how does that match up against a pretty good Texas defense? So I, I do think that's an intriguing game and will be very telling, not maybe more about the status of where Oklahoma's at and are they a true contender um, or are they going to be falling by the wayside again as we get into Big 12 play? Yeah, I'll I'll throw it out there. Texas and Oklahoma can kick rocks, so I'll be watch. I'll be paying more attention to Texas Tech and Baylor. Uh, Tech, who knows? Like they won ugly yesterday. We kind of talked about it, and Jimmy hit it right on the head with saying that Baylor. That's a game that could really spark them and kind of lead them the rest of the way. TC Iowa State doesn't seem very entertaining. I'm I'm gonna just say it. I don't know that there's a single Iowa State game that could be deemed entertaining uh, the the rest of this year. That's that's not a team that I would uh, would want to have to watch twelve games of football for this season. Uh, so you know, shout out to my my former coworker and friend Alec Pussy, who uh, is having to watch twelve games of Iowa State football this year, uh, regardless of of what takes place. But you know, it's it's a lighter schedule in the Big Twelve next week, uh, and really. K State, Oklahoma State, from an outside th that bubble perspective, everybody else in the league is like, well, it's on a Friday night. So if I'm at home, I'll watch it. But they're probably having the same thoughts about that as Iowa State, TCU. It's like, why would I watch that game? Uh, really, it's just those three games in the middle of the day Texas OU, UCF, KU, and, and Baylor Tech. Uh, they all have their merits for different reasons. We'll get to see where OU and Texas stack up against, against each other. And then KU, UCF, I mean, it's going to be probably a pretty telling game for for either side. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like maybe John Rice Plumley will be back for that game. That certainly adds a, an element for UCF that would help them against KU. Um, but that that'll be a fun one to watch. It's you know it's like a it's like an extra bye week next week for at least everybody that's not on the the football team for K State because we'll get a full Saturday at home again of, of watching football as opposed to uh, having to scramble around and everything else. So. Uh, any final thoughts before we, we end things on this Sunday and uh, get ready for K-State, Oklahoma State on a Friday night? Um, I mean, Friday nights are kind of fun when it's a road game. Yes. Not and for we, me. I was going to say, for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's certainly fun if you have no skin in the high school football game. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Because you know what's you know what's there's not I got nothing going on on Friday night. It's it's actually very good for me uh, in terms of other things. Eh, I don't know about that. You know, like I it's it sucks if you have a kid playing high school football or if you're coaching high school football mm -hmm. or I would definitely. I mean, if I was still at like the radio station in which I was having to call high school football on a Friday night, I'd be like, oh my gosh, well I'd <laughs> rather be watching K State play. Uh, but you know, I, I'm I had I have a high school f sports hot take. I'm not going to drop it here. I think it would probably get too much heat on me. Um, I feel very passionate about it. 
eh, you know what? Screw it. I, I don't, I don't care. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in my stance on this. Um, there are only three reasons why you should care about high school sports. And let me tell them to you guys. Number one, you have a family member involved in them currently. So, you know, I, I just spent what I've been out of high school for seven years now. Uh, I last year was last year I had a brother playing high school sports. So yes, I would go to a high school baseball game. So my brother was playing. I will never be caught dead at another high school baseball game until, you know, if I have a son and he's playing high school baseball, you know, when my daughter is playing stuff, I will be there. The second she's out of school, I am not showing up to another high school game. Number two, you are actively playing high school sports, you know, like you're playing them. You should probably care about them a little bit. And number three, you're getting paid to care about them. You know, like, like, man, you are coaching. Now that's probably more about you care about the kids than you care about, you know, whatever and getting paid to care about it. But there you go. When I was covering games on the radio, like, boy, I could tell you anything you need to know about the Centennial league, the twin Valley league, the North central Kansas league, the mid East league, all of that. And you think, man, why do you know so much about high school football? It's not because I care about it, but it's because I'm getting paid nine bucks an hour for Manhattan Broadcasting to care about it, you know? And when I have to roll in Saturday morning at 6 a.m. because K-State's playing 11 a.m. kick and Powercat Game Day's bumped me up. I'm doing scoreboard Saturday and to the seven people that are listening and keep, <laughs> then, yeah, I'm going to tell you what I know about the Frankfurt Wildcats or what I know about, you know, Centralia or Clay Center or whatever. But – you know, I when I was down in Wichita, I sometimes the guys I work with they want to talk high school football on on our radio show. I'm like, this is the this is the worst. I do not care about this conversation at all. I could care less about what happens to Wichita West and Wichita East tonight. I could care less about what happens to Garden Plain and you know Cheney or whoever. It has no bearing on my life. But you know, I'd have to go out and call a game seven o'clock that night for three hours. I cared about high school football because I was paid to care about it. Those are my three things. You guys might feel differently. Obviously, for like, you know, Drew and I are now, we we obviously work for a place that, uh, you know, that the high school football thing is kind of important there. So, again, getting paid to care about high school football. If this was not your job, Drew, would you have gone to a high school football game this year or last year? Oh, no. Yeah, there you go. That's my take on high school football. Drew's alma mater may be the number one team in the state this week. That number, that is factual, though. Number two, and they're really good. I will I will say from oh. firsthand experience, they may have the best defensive front seven that I've seen. Drew, my, are you, one of has, my has one of the, one of the best I've seen in twenty some years of coaching. Is he hit you up and said, "Hey, we got a great team this year. Why are we not selling out? You know, like <laughs> get give some tickets to your followers. Get them out to rule." <laughs> That hasn't happened yet. No, it's weird. I, you know, I, I, I thought that was just something that all athletic directors did was go to social media and plead and cried, please show up, please show up. Uh, no. Okay. Oh, you're not, you don't want to come. Well, here are some free tickets to our influencers. Uh, you know, they'll give them away for us. Yeah. It's great when ADs take to Twitter and do stuff like that, especially if power five programs. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like Travis. I mean, you <laughs> you were there for a basketball national title. What are you like? Chill out. I, I don't know. It's it's weird because uh, obviously when I was working in radio in Wichita, Big Twelve Media Days. I had to cover both K State and KU while I was down there. Aside from the one year where KU didn't get on the plane and didn't show up, um, that was funny. Um, that was a great real entrance into to the Lance Leipold era. But, the, you know, the second year I was down there, I did get to talk with Lance Leipold and Travis Goff. And Lance Leipold, I mean, he's kind of a quirky dude, but I think we know a lot of college football coaches are. Mm-hmm. He came off as like a dude that obviously knows what he's doing and is likable and all that, um, even though, I, you know, I, I get some people can say, you know, his personality seems a little. Talking to him, I I very much enjoyed that. Travis Goff. Snake oil salesman and a dude that is always looking to be on the the offense. Like I, I said it on the boards the other day when people were talking about the you know the tweet that he put out or whatever, and everybody begging for people to show up to, to games to watch a good football team. I was like, you know, he's the kind of guy that he could be, you know, on the other side of the room and he sees you talking 
and he's going to think you're talking and laughing about him. And so he's immediately got to say something and get out in front of it. When in reality, you're just like, hey, yeah, like, uh, you know, a little cold in this room. You know, they could bump the air up from 68 to like 72 or something and save him some money. And Travis Goff would be over there like, what are you saying about me? What are you, uh, like, I, I don't know. He's just very uh, on edge and, and worried about that kind of stuff. Like, and I get it to some extent. You have a good football coach in Lance Leipold that people view as being easily pluckable. You want to try and do as much as you can to show that this is a place that you should want to stay at and you can be successful at. And obviously you can get to a certain level of success, but you need people to care about it at some point. Like, Jim Harbaugh, obviously the NFL is a little bit of a different beast, but I bet if people cared a lot more about Stanford football, he probably would have had a tougher time bolting for the 49ers. Instead, he's got you know top 10 teams every year, Pac-12 champs, and it's like we've got 500 people watching us tonight, you know, against at home against like Oregon, or it's all green in here. And I think, you know, you're doing all you can, but uh tra yeah, Travis Goff, he might want to take a break from social media you know i a lot of celebrities do it they take breaks and they're gone for like five days i think five days would be helpful for travis goff you know take a little a step back trav it'd be okay uh but i'm sure if any ku fans get a hold of this episode they're gonna just be <laughs> tweeting nasty things at me again they tweeted nasty things at me after my ku food review uh at the illinois game where i complimented their football team and crowd i i said nice things in that i even complimented the dish that i ate like i Whatever. They, they're they an odd bunch. But I don't hate you guys. I want you to know that. <laughs> I hate your school, and I hate that you went there, but I don't hate you as people, most of you, like I do the TCU Horned Frogs. They suck, and we should hate them as people because they're awful.